Hey everybody, uh, my name is Rich Lafferty and today I want to talk about talking about reliability and how you can use surface level objectives to provide a framework to talk about and improve your reliability. Because once you have a way to talk about reliability, you can take specific steps to improving it to whatever level is right for your product, your service, or your organization. But first, let me introduce myself real quick. This is me. Uh, I'm a staff reliability engineer at PagerDuty. I'm in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, mostly I work on human factors, reliability, safety, basically the points at which the technical parts of our complex systems meet the people parts. My background is infra infrastructure engineering, and I still do some of that, but most of my time these days is spent working on so socio-technical systems. And this is this is Stella. She, you know, she helps. Uh, so this is going to be sort of an SLO 101. If you're struggling with how to invest in reliability, if you're just starting out with service level objectives, if you're wondering how they can help you out, and you want to start off on the right track, then you are my kind of people. Uh, now, if you're already a ways along your SLO journey, then stick around, and I think you may be able to pick up some useful bits, some pitfalls to watch out for, and so on. But I'm going to be assuming that most of you are new to SLOs. So what I want you to come away with today is an understanding of what reliability means and what it means to be reliable and how that aligns and competes with other features of your product or service. And to make your product reliable enough, you need to be able to talk about reliability with your engineers, with your product team, with your project people, with all of the stakeholders. And I believe that service level objectives are the way to do that. So I'm going to show you how to start using SLOs to bring everyone on the same page and be the basis for talking about reliability, understanding where you're at, where you want to be, and making decisions backed by data on what to do about it. There's a bunch of traps along the way, really easy mistakes to make and problems that will come up. And I'm going to walk you through some of the common ones so that you'll see them coming and hopefully avoid them when you get there. And finally, I'm going to give you a rough idea of how to get started. So let's start off by making sure we understand what it means to be reliable. So reliability isn't jargon. It just means that people can rely on your product or service to do what they need to do when they need to do it. Your software product being reliable is no different than your coffee maker being reliable. I mean, there's more complexity to it. But if you get good hot coffee in about 10 minutes every time you turn on your coffee maker, you've got a reliable coffee maker. It does what you need to do when you need to do it. And if it's not reliable, if the coffee is weak sometimes, or sometimes it takes half an hour, or you have to unplug it, plug it back in to get it to start, then you're going to be less happy and maybe even unhappy. Now, in software, there's a few attributes that are traditionally pulled in under reliability. Availability is one of them. You know, is the service even up? And some people kind of stop there, but it's not enough. The service also has to be performant. It can't have too much latency. Requests need to be successful and not error out. The responses need to be correct and give out the proper response. And finally, you know, it should be durable and not lose any data that it was entrusted with. If a service can't be reached, if it's unusably slow, if it produces errors, if it gives back the wrong data, or if it loses data, then users can't rely on it. And that's going to make users unhappy. So I'm talking a lot about happiness here. Now, one thing I've noticed is that reliability tends to be considered a technical problem. Engineers talk about it and report on it. You know, when there's problems, engineers respond to the incident, and then you do an incident review with mostly engineers in the room, and you come up with a bunch of engineering action items. And so what ends up happening is there's like a pendulum based on incidents. You look at the quantity and the severity of your incidents, and whether or not action items from incident reviews are being completed. You use that to decide whether to swing the pendulum all the way over to the feature development side or all the way over to the engineering improvement side, and I'm not sure that gets it right. So the aha moment I had a while ago is that reliability is fundamentally about making users happy. Reliability is part of your user experience. You know, at PagerDuty, the fact that our users can count on us to alert them when an event comes in, um, or if their run book, when they hit the button that the run book runs, that's a major selling point of our business. What that all means is that reliability is a product feature. It's part of the user experience. And that means reliability is in the domain of product. And as a feature, it naturally competes with other features that make users happy, whether that's net new functionality, user experience improvements, bug fixes. And just like it's possible to underinvest in reliability, it's also possible to overinvest. If you spend time on making things more reliable than what your users need, then you're giving, thing, giving them things that they don't care about and not giving them other features that they'd rather have. So if reliability is a feature, just like the rest of your product features, and you need to regularly make and revisit decisions to make sure you're investing the right amount in all of those areas, you need a way to have those conversations, both about what level of reliability makes users happy and whether or not you're hitting that level. And that is where service level objectives come in, also known as SLOs. 
So SLOs originally came out of Google from a book called Site Reliability Engineering. Now, a lot of that book was about how Google does things and how Google does things doesn't always scale down to smaller companies, but I think this one does. The fundamental idea behind SLOs is this. You pick some key metrics around reliability. Those are service level indicators or SLIs. You set a goal for those metrics, that's the SLO, and you measure how frequently you meet or don't meet that objective. Then you use whether or not you've met the objective to inform your decisions about what to work on next. That sounds really simple, right? And it is, that's what's so great. Now, before I get into the details of how this all fits together, I wanna to make sure we don't get confused about one thing. You've probably heard of SLAs, service level agreements before, and this sounds kind of like that. Well, here's the difference. An SLA is an agreement. It's part of some kind of contract, usually some kind of formal legal contract between companies or even inside a company, sort of an informal social contract between departments. It's a promise to meet a certain service level. It usually comes with some kind of automatic consequences for not meeting it, like a financial penalty or something. But an SLO isn't a promise. It's an objective. It's a goal. We want to meet the goal. We might meet the goal. We might not meet the goal. If we don't, we're going to have to figure out what to do about it, but we haven't broken any promises, and there are no automatic consequences other than having conversations about what to do. Now, over time, if a team keeps missing its SLOs, there are probably going to be some difficult conversations to have. But SLAs are agreements between entities, and SLOs are goals set from within. Let's come back to SLOs. Let's start with an example. If you picture a basic website, user goes to the website in their browser and they get some long docs. That's it. Request, response, nothing complicated. Now there's a whole bunch of metrics you can get from that. And here's something that I came up with. Now, all of those are unarguably metrics. You can track each of those in Sumo, although you know availability can be tricky because if you're unavailable, you might not know that a request came in. But looking at that list, there are some metrics that are related to user happiness and some that aren't. Okay, the user wants us to be available, that's good, yeah, and they probably want a response within a particular amount of time, but whether or not the request took a lot of CPU doesn't really matter to the user. Uh, error code, well, they care if it was an error or not. Memory use, same as CPU, doesn't really matter. Byte returned is a little tricky. If it's zero, then the user's probably not happy, but they probably don't care about the actual number. So here's a bunch of things that are related to user happiness, and that makes those a special kind of metric. And that metric is called a service level indicator, or an SLI. So we have four SLIs for this website, and we can say a user is going to be happy if the site's available, if the response time is fast enough, let's just say 500 milliseconds. There are no errors, and then some data actually made it back to them. So now we can set our objectives. That's easy. We want to be up 100% of the time. We want to be fast enough 100% of the time. We want a successful response on 100% of requests, and we never want to return zero bytes. Okay, that's not going to work. You probably already detected the problem here. This is going to be impossible to meet. What we're saying is the software has to be perfect, and we know it's not going to be perfect. And if we try to be perfect, then there's going to be no time left to improve anything else about the website. So now we sit down to negotiate things. The product owner, the engineers, all the stakeholders, they start talking about what good enough is, what we need to make users happy. And so let's say they decide up 99% of the time, response time is fast enough 99% of the time, uh, only 1% of requests are errors, and we'll just call those zero byte responses errors so we don't need to track another thing. And we're gonna track it over a one week window. All right, so in a few weeks pass by. Turns out we're at 99.92% of the time. We respond faster than 500 milliseconds on 99.99% of requests, and we return errors on about 1.5% of requests. And that's pretty good, but we're not meeting the error rate SLO. Nothing happens automatically. We notice that we're not hitting our goal, and that prompts a conversation about it. There are a bunch of ways that conversation might go. Maybe the engineers investigate and find it's one particular part of the code that's always erroring, and they want to fix it right away. But maybe we're close to a product launch and product thinks that customers will be happier with getting the new launch on time and at the expense of some more errors for a week or two. But then the engineers are concerned that the launch is going to produce even more errors and they want to get these ones finished up. I don't know what the right answer is. The important part is now we have some shared goals. But there's a line in the sand to talk about reliability and specific numbers that we can use to inform the trade-offs. Before there was a problem, we decided what was good enough. And we don't have to argue now about what good enough is. We just have to deal with the fact that we're not good enough. Now, there were two things that happened in that example. One is that the response time was considerably better than our goal. The other is that we weren't able to act on the error rate until users were already unhappy. We can address both of those with error budgets.
An error budget is how much of the SLO you have left to spend before you start failing to meet it. It's literally a budget for errors. I don't want to get into the details of the math too much here, but it's important to get the math rate on SLOs. But to use our response time example, our goal is to be better than 500 milliseconds on 99% of requests. Our actual performance is that we're doing it on 99.99% .99 of requests. What that means is that you know, if you're measuring over the course of a week, we could be slower on another 0.99% of requests and still not break the SLO. If there's 1 billion requests per week, that means you have 100,000 requests or about an hour's worth that you could choose to spend. So there's no bonus prize for being more reliable than your SLO. You know, maybe you want to do some maintenance that you know will affect response time for a little while, and now you know there's room to do so. Or maybe you'll do a little chaos engineering and inject some latency into the network. Or maybe you think that that release that's coming up has a chance of impacting response time and you just want to hold onto that extra room just in case. Just like the SLO, the error budget doesn't tell you what to do. It prompts the conversations about what to do. But what about our error rate SLO violation? Earlier, I talked about keeping track of things in advance. And the error budget here is our leading indicator. By forecasting how the error budget is used, we can predict when the SLO is going to be violated and we can respond to that proactively. The error budget doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you the information you need to know what you think is going to happen, and then you can have the conversation about what to do. So now that we've got a general idea of how an SLO might work on one service, let's think bigger. Um, if you think about a microservice, let's say you know a user service that manages application users, your customers don't really care about that service. What they care about is what they need to do in your application, and here's where SLOs get particularly product-oriented. Because not only can you have an SLO for an individual service, you can also have them from an entire subsystem. And since we're trying to connect SLOs with user happiness, the subsystems we care about align with user journeys. I think we do this pretty well at PagerDuty. We treat the user journey of event goes in, black box, notification goes out as a single subsystem whose performance we measure that we call the notification pipeline. That's even tied to an SLA we've had for a long time because it turns out that sending notifications on events is really important to keeping PagerDuty users happy. And when you have SLOs on user journey, you're even more directly connected to user happiness. And then you can use the SLOs underneath them on individual services to find the hotspots that might be affecting the user journey. So you've got your key metrics, your SLIs, and you're ready to set an SLO. So where do you start? There's a few approaches that you can take to start the conversation. And keep in mind, this is a conversation. You're negotiating this among the stakeholders. It's most important to just pick a number, any reasonable number, than to get the perfect number, because you can revisit it regularly. The first approach is straightforward. You use your historical performance. You know, if you think users are happy right now, then take those numbers and start measuring. You might be surprised that you don't hit them as often as you might think, or maybe there's just one SLI that's not quite where you want it. It's got a lot of variability. You're going from having a gut feel about your reliability to having actual numbers and that great. But if users aren't happy right now, it gets a little bit trickier. If you set the objective high, then you're going to start out with a lot of red SLOs. Avoid making everything red. It's going to discourage the folks that are trying to get used to this process. Instead, start off with your historical performance and just choose one attainable improvement. You can focus on one thing and make sure you don't slide in other aspects while you focus on it. It's a lot like setting financial goals. If you're way off, trying to fix it by setting a really big goal isn't going to do. You have to identify the small steps to be there, to get there, and talk about them often and compare actuals. So making sure you're not backsliding. Once you meet that goal, you can choose the next step and so on, always using the rest of your SLOs to monitor whether or not you're where you want to be. Because the real goal here is to establish a new culture of talking about reliability with numbers, and then that culture is where your reliability improvements come from. All right, so with the basics of setting SLOs, I want to quickly go over some of the problems that I've seen as people roll them out. One big one is averages. I mean, real average, like taking the mean of some metric. The problem is that averages aren't useful if you don't know the distribution, if the distribution isn't normal, and if the distribution changes. So instead of using averages, use percentiles. You care most about the worst experiences that users are having, and percentiles can capture that. The industry standard is to use the 95th percentile, so 95% of users have latency or error rate or whatever better than some target. Higher than 95 might be appropriate in some circumstances too, but you're not doing anything now, start at 95. 
And the other thing is to be careful that you're not accidentally averaging. Uh, I know one monitoring vendor for a long time had a percentiles feature, but it would calculate the percentile on each monitoring agent. So what it was really doing was calculating the 95th percentile on the specific server, and then averaging all of the 95th percentiles across the servers, which isn't really giving you the data that you want. You want your data to be as rich as possible at the point where the SLO is calculated. The next problem is having too many. It can be really easy, especially in a microservices environment, to have a lot of SLOs. The more you have, the harder it is to track things. And if you have a lot of red SLOs, then you can end up playing whack-a-mole while improving one makes the others worse. You really want to focus on your key service level indicators and use user journeys to roll up service SLOs into broader SLOs. You know, for instance, early we realized that no empty responses and error rate SLOs could be combined into one SLO. Now, if that goes red, it'll take a little bit more investigation work to find out exactly what's contributing to it, but that might make overall SLO management and tracking easier. Dependencies. So when you set an SLO for a service that depends on another service, you have to account for the SLO of that other service. What this means is that SLOs are also a way to talk about reliability between teams, which is great, right? But sometimes I hear people say things like, you know, a service can't have an SLO that's higher than one of its dependencies. And that's not quite true. The trivial example that I like to use is a user service that depends on an avatar service. Users are really unhappy when the user service is unavailable and they can't log in at all, but they're only a tiny bit unhappy if when they log in, they don't have their picture in the top corner. So it's not quite right to say that services can only be reliable as their upstreams. What's actually the case is that services have to know about the reliability of their upstreams. In the avatar case, the user service could cache avatars. It could display a placeholder if they're not available. And that way, the important user service can meet a high reliability SLO, even if the avatar service is only returning responses, successful responses half the time. All right, waking people up. Uh, that's pagey, the pager, pager duty pager. Uh, it's really easy to go, okay, now we have SLO, so if we miss one, we should wake someone up right away, right? Or fire up a major incident or something. Now, at pager duty, we really care a lot about on-call health, and we try to wake people up as infrequently as possible. And the reason that you don't need to wake people up when you bust an SLO is that SLOs move slowly. Air budgets also move slowly, but here's where we can alert people proactively. At any point, we know how long we have until the error budget is exhausted. And we know how quickly we've been spending it until now and how quickly we're burning it up. And all those things are opportunities to intervene. If you know it's going to cross the line in a day or a week, then you can forecast that. And you can send someone, maybe even the product owner, a during business hours notification, which prompts the conversation about what to do. Or you can monitor the burn rate itself, which is you know, the derivative of the error budget. And if that increases, you know something material has happened. And that should alert someone to take a look. But again, it can be during business hours. Uh, but making only engineers accountable. Um, I say this one for last because it's really important. The reason we're doing this is to keep users happy and to give the organization a way to have conversations about reliability. This requires participation beyond engineering teams. For internal services, that might be representatives from the departments that use your services. For product services, that usually means product owners who represent customer needs. My favorite way to make this work is to make the product owner, maybe the product owner and engineering manager together, accountable for setting and meeting SLOs and for deciding what to do if one goes red. What you want is to trigger the right conversations and provide the right incentives, and you can't do that if SLOs are treated like engineering metrics. All right, so once Illuminate is over, once you get back to your team, you want to give this a go. What do you do? Here's the steps we follow to get SLOs going at PagerDuty. First of all, get buy-in. You know, if you're a product-oriented org, you need to get product on board, and this is where reliability as a feature comes in. You're giving them insight into how much time they can spend on new features and how much time they can, should spend on making the users happy through reliability. Then, real early, get the technical stuff out of the way. You know, choose a platform to track your SLOs. Sumo Logic is just launched there, so you should try that one out. Um, but platform is kind of a one-way decision because once you start collecting data, it's hard to change later. Get your test data in place. Make sure you have the basics of getting data in and out uh, understood. And understand your metrics collection to make sure you can get reliable percentile data out of it and not get stuck with averages. Next, start off with a pilot team, ideally one that has a variety of services and some end-to-end -end user journeys. If you have like both web services and queue consumers, then you want SLOs for both. And the point of the pilot is to discover the patterns that you're going to use when you spread SLOs out to the rest of your org. Uh, you can even have the pilot team send their data to multiple platforms to see which one gives them the best user experience. 
I think it's probably a good idea to start with a team that's aware of SLOs, but hasn't gone very far down the path, you know, a greenfield rather than a brownfield team. Um, once you start focusing on company patterns, you can loop in the teams that have had a head start on SLOs on their own, but it's a lot easier to start out where there's nothing than when you need to move the needle on something. Uh, in a second, you know, I'm going to point you to some resources that get down into the weeds exactly how to move on SLOs. But the last thing I want to mention is making sure you set your project goal correctly. The North Star here is making SLOs the language of reliability. Once you connect SLOs with user happiness and make your product and engineering folks both accountable for setting, monitoring, and meeting them, then you've got the building parts of reliability culture that's based on a common framework and understanding without having to wait for incidents, without recency bias, in a fundamentally user-centric way. And just quick, before I move on to questions, I want to mention I'm kind of standing on the shoulders of giants here. There's two resources that I want to point you towards that help me figure out SLOs and how to roll them out that I hope will be useful to you too. The first is where it all started, the Google Site Reliability Engineering book, which has a chapter on SLOs, which is probably the thing that really launched SLOs outside of Google in the first place. The book is definitely worth buying, but the full contents are also available online, legally, hosted by Google. The second is an excellent book by an author that happens to be a friend of mine, but which I'd recommend in any case, and that's Implementing Service Level Objectives by Alex Hidalgo. Uh, it's also published by Harari. This one you need to buy. Um, it's worth it though, and it's a real full length book. It's not one of those little tiny books that O'Reilly has started publishing lately. Alex has put a ton of thought in how to get SLOs right and build up that culture. So thank you very much. I hope this is worthwhile and you're excited to go launch some SLOs and that you enjoy the rest of the conference.